Hello everyone and welcome to the final day of AID 2021. It's my pleasure to introduce our third and final keynote speaker, Dr. Brahm Ritter. Dr. Ritter earned his PhD in computer science from King's College London, where his research focused on AI planning for autonomous robots. Everything from robots for undersea exploration to robots that play games with children. Dr. Ritter is now AI programmer at Rebellion, so thank you Dr. Ritter for speaking to us today. Hi, my name is uh, Bram. I work at Rebellion, and today I'm going to talk about how we've improved the automated game testing uh, using a AI planning system at its uh, score. Uh, in particular, I'll look at the input simulation side of things. So, a bit of background about myself. Um, so, a relatively new father. My daughter will be 11 months old when this uh, comes out. Um, I used to work in academia, so I got a PhD in AI planning systems. Uh, and after work, so I've worked for about like seven years uh, on uh, as a postdoc on mainly autonomous robotic uh, systems, and I created AI playing uh, frameworks for those. So I joined the game industry about four years ago, uh, which is like a long held ambition of mine. Um, so I joined Rebellion and first worked uh, on Zombie Army 4 for about two years. Uh, and after the game shipped, I moved over to the uh, engine team. Uh, I was tasked to replace the uh, automated input simulation uh, system. So when we talk about uh, automated game testing, what we, what we mean by that is we try to play the game uh, like a player would by simulating uh, keyboards or mouse presses or a controller input depending on the platform or game you're playing at the time. Uh, and the reason for doing so is you try to, uh, first of all, get as much code coverage as possible to detect any memory leaks or crashes uh, in the game by playing it. And secondly, we also use a lot of uh, telemetry to basically uh, figure out how well the game is, is running. So we record the, uh, the frames per second, uh, memory usage, and a lot of other things. So we do this for all games, uh, both in development and already released. Uh, and every team will get an email like this every morning, because we run all the tests overnight. Uh, allow for about an hour per level uh, and we run this on like a whole spectrum of different platforms. Uh, and it, the team will get like an email like this, we'll basically tell them in this instance, like this top of the email, like uh, how often they hit the FPS target, how long they take the load level, uh, we show how much memory has been used, if the application is uh, CPU bound or GPU bound, if dynamic uh, skill resolution monitor was used, and a whole myriad of other uh, stats are being recorded and uh, provided to the uh, different projects. So they can see every morning how well the project is doing uh, and what attention needs improving. Uh, second of all, we also uh, provide um, screenshots of the input sim. So every three minutes we take a screenshot so we can go to a folder and figure out what the input simulator was doing at the time. Um, and also if the FPS gets uh, below a certain threshold, we take a special screenshot that uh, shows all the uh, components of the uh, GPU and CPU, what they were working on. Uh, and it gives an idea like what a component might be uh, causing a very low uh, FPS, so the program is nowhere to look uh, for, improve for improvements. So when I started, there was an already input sim uh, simulator in place. Uh, they used to work as follows. So after the uh, level was a uh, reasonable state, the level designer would do a playthrough of the level and create a recording file. Every time so if he, did, he or she did something special, they had to press a button and basically uh, add an entry into this recording file. Uh, so every time the, um, it moved somewhere or press the button to interact with the world any, in any way or shoot a zombie or whatever it is. Uh, and then after it completed a playthrough, it had to go back and annotate the file to remember what they were doing at the time. Uh, and basically add the uh, bits that we're doing, so like to move, shoot, or cheats, whatever it is. Uh, and afterwards I had to convince a programmer to uh, encode these actions into some code that would then actually execute the behavior the developer did at the time in the game in question. So you might imagine the uh, this wasn't particularly robust because every time the level changed or the game design changed, um, it would fail and also the games are in general not deterministic so it might be that uh, at one run through like the item was in like this particular location but the next time it might be somewhere someplace else and then the uh, playthrough just failed because you assume things be true that uh, that aren't so i decided 
to replace the system completely uh, with a new input uh, simulation system. And I put like some high goals uh, in mind because I want this just not to just run through a level uh, somewhat or play level for an hour and then just quit. Uh, I want to actually be able to complete all games um, that it basically would, so would run on, so both finished and the ones are still in the development. Secondly, I want to minimize how much work and time uh, designers, level designers have to put in to make the system not work on the levels or games. Uh, and lastly, I want to make sure it's actually robust. Um, so if the levels or games are changed or after it's been released, additional DLC content or levels are being added, it should work on them out of the box without too much, uh, too much hassle. So the solution I came up with is to use a hybrid system where we use an AI planning system to do the reasoning about how do we have to go about in a level to, uh, to complete it. And in runtime, use behavior trees to actually execute the actions that the planner uh, come up with. Because the reason it happens in the planning system, it means that the uh, behavior trees themselves are actually very small uh, and modular. So they're very easy to, uh, to code and, uh, and maintain. So before we get into it too much further, there, it's a best uh, I think it's a good idea to reflect on how the academia uh, differs from the real world. In this case, the game industry where I'm working on. Um, so ICAP is like the main conference for uh, AI planners. And every few years they hold a competition um, where they allow for like half an hour of, of time to do the planning, about 8 gigabyte memory, uh, the problem is static, the goals you need to achieve are all given to you and you don't have to execute. The moment you got a plan, you're done. Uh, whereas in my case, you get a few minutes extra frame if you're lucky, uh, you only got a few megabytes of memory you can actually use for the playing system. Uh, you need to plan while the game is still running um, and the goals you need to kind of figure out what they are a bit depending on the game. And you have to kind of extract them from the data uh, of the game that's going to be running. Uh, and then you also need to execute the plan that you find. It's not enough to say, like, well, this is how you solve the level. You have to go in and actually uh, execute the plan that you uh, come up with. So a planning uh, problem consists of two uh, components. So you got the domain, which is a model of the game uh, that you try to work on. So you need to specify three types, uh, so three things. So first of all, it's the types of things that exist in your game. So you got locations, players, enemies, weapons, grenades, whatever your game has. They need to specify what kind of properties, relations do they have. Can a player be at the location? Can a player pick items up? Can items be thrown? Can items be shared between players? Can they move between locations? Uh, and lastly, you need to specify what can a player do in the world? Uh, what actions can they execute? When they can execute them? And how does the game change uh, changed? once uh, the execute an action. So then during the runtime, you have to create a problem. So here you specify well, what objects of what type are currently in the world uh, and what facts are currently true in the world we're looking at. So what's the initial state? And then you need to find out well, what are the goals you try to achieve from the current state you're in. And the planner will take these two and will uh, reason about it and come up with a sequence of actions that when you execute them from the current states, you end up in a state where all the goals you specified are true. Uh, and this kind of system is used like in many different uh, scenarios and uh, contexts for anything like uh, warehouse management to Mars rovers to various robotic systems uh, to automated uh, uh, surgery to control like an urban network uh, by uh, planning how to uh, operate the uh, traffic lights to get maximum throughput of traffic. Uh, and of course in games, usually in the context of uh, GOP or HCNs. So let's look at an example of a model of a uh, fictional game that we can uh, kind of come up with. So in our game, we've got a player and a location as types. We say a player can be at location, a player can be dead, and two locations can be connected to each other. Then we got enemies, and enemies can also be at locations that can also be dead. And to simplify the domain, we can create a super type called actor, and we say an actor can be at location, actor can be dead. 
you've got items so an item can be at location and an, an actor can also have a number of items in, in its infantry so we've got two types of uh, predicates we've got boolean predicates can be true or false or we've got numerical predicates where we can assign a number so in this case how many items of a certain type does an actor have in its infantry uh, because items and actor can also be at location, we can uh, create a new super type called locatable and say a locatable can be at a location. And lastly, we've got a door. So in this case, we can say we've got a door that can be opened by a certain item um, and we've got to create like two locations on either side of the door and say when the door opens, these two locations are now connected. So that's how you can model uh, a door uh, preventing play passing through two different uh, locations. So the predicates by themselves don't really mean all that much without the actions. So I have a look what the actions look like. So in our game, we can the player can move between two different locations. So we can say a player can move from a location to another location if these two locations are in fact connected. And if you do move, the player is no longer at the from location, but now moved to the to location. Uh, it's bare noticing that we don't have a move actor or move locatable action here because the players can only got agency over the player, can't move enemies. Then we've got a open action, where you can say a player can open a door using a particular item that door accepts, uh, and that will open up the two locations on either side of the door. So we can say if the player is at a door, uh, and the door in question blocks that location to the door, the location outside the door, and the player has at least one item door requires to, uh, to open it, then we can execute the open action, which means that the two locations on the door now become connected. Uh, the door no longer blocks these locations, and we actually consume the item that play use to interact with this uh, with the door. We got a pickup action, so the player shares the location with an item. Then we can remove the item from the location and put it in the player's inventory. Then we got a kill action, so if a player and an enemy share a location, then the player can kill the enemy. And the effect is that the enemy is now dead. Uh, we don't remove the enemy being at the location because that's actually been used by the next action, the loot action. So we say if the player and enemy share the same location and the enemy is dead, and the enemy's got at least one item of a specific type of its, if it's infantry, then we can remove that item from the enemy's infantry and put it into the player's infantry. So this is the complete model of our uh, little game. So we've got our types, our predicates, and our actions. So let's do an example of how we would use this during runtime. So we see like a runtime example. Um, what the first thing we normally do is we actually um, create the objects that, uh, that exists. So in this case, we've got a zombie of type enemy, we've got a key of type item, we've got a player of type player, we've got a bit of C4, also of type item, and then we got our two doors of type door. Now, generally, we then we need to uh, create locations at um, location items at the appropriate uh, positions. So we got location items for the uh, player zombie. So we got the zombie location, but also we need to figure out the two locations on either side of the door. And we normally use like physics uh, queries and a lot of side checks to figure out where the locations make sense and at what point a player can interact with a door uh, and what the location is on the other side of the door. So these are generated for the both uh, for both doors. So we got a location for the items. We got a goal location where we want the player to get to and last we got the location where the player itself is. So then we need to figure out well what's the initial state work, which predicates are true initial states. So we say the player is at the player location, the zombie is at the zombie location, the C4 is in the C4 location. We say the zombie holds an item of type key. It's got one of one key in its, in its infantry. Uh, then we need to figure out well, which of all these locations are currently connected. And we do that by uh, performing loads of, um, of pathfinders on a very core cool snap mesh to figure out like, well, what other cliques of locations are all like fully, uh, fully connected. Uh, then we need to specify for the doors uh, which two locations they um, they, they uh, can connect up when they open it and what type of item they need to be opened. So left one needs a key to open and on the right needs a bit of C4 to be opened up. Uh, and lastly, the goal state is the player being at the goal location. We don't care what the rest of the world looks like. As long as this fact is true, 
in A, so we got two done, we're happy. So a plan can look something like this. So we move the player to the C4 location, pick up the C4, move to the door, blow it up, then go to the zombie, kill it, uh, loot the zombie to get the key, then move to the other door, open it up, and then finally uh, get to the goal location. And as you can see, the actions here are actually very simple behavior treats to, uh, to execute, which is one of the benefits of this, uh, this system. So the overall architecture looks like this. So we've got the AI playing system, then for every game we need to uh, create a domain, so specify what type can exist, what pops call through, and what actions can uh, the player execute, and when can X be executed, and how does it change the uh, state of the game. Then we got a playing problem we need to generate, so what we do is we got an execution monitor that drives the entire system. So during runtime, if there's no plan, nothing's going on, the execution monitor will then scrape the game for all the data that we need, it will create the initial state and we'll also figure out what are the current goals that we need to achieve. It presents these, it creates a plain problem, then asks the AI planner to create a plan and the planner will then return a sequence of actions. And the execution ones will hold on to the sequence and dispatch them one by one to the player to be executed. The player's got a controller and the control will invoke or create a system that's capable of achieving the action it needs to uh, execute. So in our case, it's just behavior trees, but it could be scripts, neural networks, whatever system you want to use to the actual execution of actions. So eventually the, the system will return back whether it succeeded or failed to execute the action. And this is passed back to the execution monitor. If it succeeded, then the execution monitor will take the next action in the sequence, dispatch it, and this will keep going until either a action fails or all the actions in the planner has been executed, in which case the execution monitor will again reevaluate what the current game state is, create a new initial state and create a new, uh, the new goals, create a new planning problem to be solved, evoke the planner again, and this system keeps going and going and going until we either uh, get into a game over state or if you run out of uh, time, usually about an hour, and the system just uh, just quits. So let's look at some games and how they uh, perform. So first of all, look at Zombie Army 4, which is an arcade shooter where you are in Italy, which is being invested by zombies, and a Hitler has escaped from hell, and you are basically there to basically shoot him back to hell and kill all the zombies in the uh, process. It's quite a fun four-player co-op uh, co game. So the way the system works is um, the player is guided by objective markers in the level and we use those objective markers that are active to generate the goals that we need to achieve. So the way it works is if we got an objective marker not linked to anything, we create a uh, goal to move the player to that location. If it's linked to a zombie, we kill a, uh, create a goal to kill that zombie. If it's an NPC, interact with the NPC. Uh, if it's a component, then we try to interact with that component. Now sometimes uh, they don't quite line up. So in this case here we've got the, the first level uh, an objective marker that's not linked to anything. So the planning system will then try to create a goal to move the player to that location, whereas it should actually kill the zombies that are on the radio tower blocking the signal. So what we need to do is to add the QIDs of the zombies to the objective marker. So once we analyze objective markers, okay, actually so there's four QIDs who relate to zombies, so we need to create four goals to kill these four zombies and not try to get to this objective marker. Then sometimes the goal that we generate by default uh, doesn't quite match up to what actually needs to happen. So for example, here, this objective marker here is, is linked to a component, which normally means we need to uh, create a location near that uh, component and tell the uh, playing system that one of the goals is to interact with that component. Uh, in this case, it actually the playing system destroy the component, so the uh, level designer can tick a little box in the bottom right and say force destroy, indicating that we should create a destroy component goal and not an interact with this component goal. Uh, lastly, we need to update the NetMesh slightly because normally uh, the level design um, allows players to kind of wander off the edge and drop down into an area, but if there's no uh, connections on the nav mesh, 
and the input system goes, okay, when you go to down this hall, but there's no path that it doesn't know quite know how to drop down in this, uh, this section. So we need to do add a uh, special um, um, uh, nav mesh connections that are unique and only usable by the input simulator. So it knows how to drop down into this, uh, into this cage. So it normally took about five to 10 minutes to update the levels by going through all the uh, objective markers and update them accordingly. So the uh, uh, playing system knew what kind of goals it needs to, uh, needs to generate for inputs into uh, to follow. So we got an example of a level zoo. It's like the fourth level in the uh, zombie army game. Uh, so I added the video to speed it up slightly and to jump to different interesting bits. So here we see the zoom fight uh, grenadiers. So eventually after they kill all the uh, zombies in the initial state, it needs to go into the main zoo bit and flip uh, three uh, switches to get access to the uh, to the polar pair, bear pit in the very sense of the, the game. So this is the two red, this is the last one. So flips it and then runs back upstairs and then finds a way to get, in, get into this uh, bit. So this is the bit where you need to do, add the additional uh, left connection mesh. So currently got an objective marker that's linked to the blood fountain and knows it needs to interact with it, so it does so. And then they kill all the zombies that are there. And then finally, it's got a goal to move into the uh, into the safe room. So here we use the previous model of the of the door, so it knows how to how to interact with the door to open it up and get access to in this case the uh, the safe room. So one thing we uh, did halfway through this project is to um, model that a player can run out of ammunition. So we say if one of the uh, guns is empty, like we see here, we say, well, we can't kill zombies if you don't have full ammunition. And the player got two ways to get ammunition. One is to go to a um, ammunition uh, pickup box, or we saw here basically stamp a zombie that's got ammunition in its uh, infantry. So it's basically itself looting, which is uh, basically stomp the zombies, so the ammunition basically sprays out and we collect them on the way. Uh, so another thing to note is that we um, that the behavior tree is actually responsible for knowing like how to fight different uh, different zombies. So we saw there is actually shot the heart of the shadow demon. So it comes to officers, you see here a slight different behavior where actually stomp the officers. So actually, um, uh, actually the body basically uh, gets completely destroyed because some officers can uh, resurrect, and if you don't kill resurrection officers, then another one might pop up and resurrect the previous one and then get like a infinite fight. So here we see the input sim picking up uh, objects because it's, it's got a component that requires certain objects to be interacted with. So it knows uh, where to go to pick up the objects and then go to the uh, a component to interact with it. So here we see another behavior where it kills a uh, officer and then the behavior goes about to actually kill the officer. So the planner just says we'll kill the zombie and it's up to the behavior tree to figure out what the best way uh, what's the best way to, to go about doing that. So here we got the last objective in the last section of the game where it needs to interact with a component that requires an item. So it's done that. Now all the rigs are set and then we blow up the planetarium there by finishing the, uh, the level. So this took about 25 minutes to run through the entire uh, mission begin to uh, begin to end. So you got like a rough idea like how the input simulator plays this, uh, this game. So the next game we looked into was uh, Evil Genius 2, which is a much more uh, interesting uh, game. So instead of uh, killing zombies, you're here in Metro Manage like an Evil Genius's lair. We need to be, uh, build rooms, uh, build furniture, build like infrastructure to go out in the world to rob banks and do all sorts of like evil deeds. And at the same time, defend your lair against the forces of justice who will come in and try to stop your evil, uh, evil plans. Uh, and eventually build your doomsday de device and slowly but surely dominate the entire world and take over. It's called like World of Nation for a reason. So this is like a much more interesting and involved game. Um, of course, you need to balance like, a lot of different uh, resources, like both like power, gold, broadstar casting power. You need to make sure that your lair has got enough infrastructure to make sure that your minions are all happy and content so they don't, uh, don't become like, disloyal. Make sure you got enough defenses to defend against the uh, force of justice. Will eventually come in to uh, destroy everything. 
Um, and very often it can be like your entire leg has like burned out, so you need to figure out the best way to deal with that uh, scenario. So here we see the tutorial being uh, being played. So again, it's fast forwarded, and we skip a few sections just to give an idea of like, roughly how this uh, this game plays. Uh, and the tutorial section is quite easy because you can just you can just create the uh, the can just create the goals, look at the current objectives, and just create a goal to do that particular thing. Which works fine for the tutorial, but once you get into the main game, uh, you need to add additional goals to actually make sure that your layer is properly uh, managed. Um, and you'll see here, like a bit of that is already happening because we do like uh, research at the same time whilst we do all these uh, these schemes to get, you know, enough money to build our land infrastructure, get enough power to power everything. So yeah, there's a lot of things to, to manage because the uh, the world map you see here, uh, every region's got a heat uh, gauge. And if you do like uh, evil deeds on the world map, the heat will rise up. And if you create too much heat, a dire region will shut down, meaning you can't access and do anything in that region. So you need to make sure that heat doesn't get too much and maintain those uh, levels as well, whilst also doing all the bits in your, info, in your, in your layer. It's quite a, uh, a very cool game and creates some really interesting uh, playing problems. And I think it's by far the most um, yeah, fun game I've, I've worked on just because the sheer complexity of it and really showcases the power of the uh, playing system in action. So if we get to the end bit here. So the Ableton tutorial is uh, to build an intersectum for your, uh, for your genius. And once you build your impressive desk, the uh, tutorial is over. So we see the plan is adjusting by creating more power. That is eventually required to uh, to power your impressive uh, desk your genius uh, sits on. So here it basically recruits more minions to make sure all the furniture in the uh, in layers are properly operated. And then finally, once the uh, desk is, uh, is placed, the tutorial is done. It takes about like hour 15, one hour 15 minutes to, to complete the tutorial at the moment. So the tutorial is fine, but we very quickly find out that after you go to the main game after the tutorial, your lair will more than often be on fire or your minions will be there. You're basically just in a very bad, bad state because you can't just follow the uh, or create goals that are just the current objectives. You actually need to manage your lair. So we need to add a lot more goals to, uh, to, the, uh, to the system. So I need to make sure we got enough minions to so all jobs can be uh, performed. Uh, make sure we got enough specialized min minions to do those special jobs like research or guarding bits. Um, enough infrastructure. Make sure your minions are fed, are healthy, are you know smart. Uh, make sure we got enough fire extinguishers. So in case fire breaks out, you got all the equipment ready to go to put them out. Uh, make sure enough like a defense force to defend against the force of justice and there's like so many different subsystems to, uh, to manage. Um, as part of it we need to add a lot more additional goals to the uh, playing problem to make sure that the layers in, in always in like a, uh, a good state. Uh, so one example here is uh, to make sure that uh, a large part of our, uh, our layer is actually ob uh, observed at all times by cameras. So here we see uh, a result of the additional goals that we impose uh, by by the inputs to creating like a massive uh, camera network. So if anything uh, bad happens, like uh, basically force of justice coming your lair, you know where they are and can actually respond in a timely manner uh, to take them down as quickly as, uh, as possible. So when it comes to modeling game, it's a topic in and of its, uh, itself. You want to strike a balance between uh, going too low level, where the actions that you uh, create to model your game map to like, individual cube presses, because then the playing problem is so complex that you probably won't find a uh, solution in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to go too high level, where you got a single action that just reads complete game and create like a massive neural network or behavior tree or will you to run the entire system. You want like a balance between the two, but how to exactly do it, it's a bit of a black art. It takes a lot of iterations and you kind of need to know the planning um, uh, system you work with, what works best for some, may not work best, uh, best for others. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna go into detail how all these games are modeled particularly. If you want, you can contact me afterwards and I'm happy to explain. 
uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how big these problems are. So as I've on before, it's got about 10 actions, it's got 13 different types since the main, about 15 predicates. Whereas Evil Genius 2 got 36 actions, 23 types, 49 predicates and 19 numeric predicates. So it's like a massively bigger uh, problem. And in both cases, we need to optimize the, uh, the planner to make sure everything runs smooth and you get a, uh, a solution in like a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so there's basically three things that we uh, did. Well, first of all, introduce heuristics. Uh, second is the pruning of the action space. Uh, a little extra is the execution, because in Evil Genius 2, you don't have to wait for every single action to be completed before you can move on to the next bit. For example, you can place a furniture um, and you move on to the next bit, because the minions will, you know, over time basically collect the furniture, put it down, you have to wait, that's not always have to wait for that to happen. Uh, that to finish. In some cases you do because you need the equipment to train a minion and that uh, you need to wait for that furniture to be placed before you can start training your minions. But if you look at the, uh, the domain model to figure out uh, which action can be executed in, uh, in parallel, I mean try to uh, use that as much as possible just because Evil Genius 2 is such a long game to, to play. So we got to heuristics. In some of before we could get away with a very simple one uh, called the Achieve Goals Heuristic. Where say given a state, uh, you just count the number of achieved goals uh, and subtract the total amount, uh, total amount of goals you to achieve. That gives you an estimate how far you are from the goal. It was mainly to, to uh, more like a symmetry, a symmetry breaking uh, device where the, where the player got like, well, like a goal zombie one and the zombie two. Well, I think it's a goal zombie two instead of zombie one. Whereas this, this risk just goes, you don't care which zombie you kill, just kill the zombies again, get all of it. But for the more complex uh, games like Evil Genius 2, we need like a more uh, advanced heuristic. So we use a numerical relaxed planning graph heuristic, where you relax the, uh, the planning problem such that uh, when you execute actions, you don't delete stuff, you just uh, add stuff to it. And in terms of uh, numeric facts, you hold a uh, upper and a lower bound of where numbers can get to. So what you do, you uh, create the first fact layer, which is the uh, values in the initial states. Then you figure which actions can be executed, and you then add all the uh, facts that the actions add, but you don't actually delete anything. So you just accumulate all the uh, predicates, boolean predicates can be achieved. And in terms of the numeric predicates, you just ex uh, extend the bounds based on how much can be added and subtracted from this, uh, from this number. So you keep building your uh, layers, and you also move all the uh, facts from the previous layer to the next layer using so-called no op action, no operation actions, uh, which we don't show in this uh, presentation for uh, for, uh, for clarity. Clarity. So you keep going until you add a, a fact layer where the goal you want to achieve are true, uh, and then you try to solve this relaxed playing problem. But sadly, you can't uh, find the optimal solution because that's an NPR problem. So what we do, we go, okay, this is the goal fake we want to achieve, and we got two actions. So we create a second heuristic to determine like which of these actions we think is cheaper to uh, to to uh, to achieve their preconditions for. So what we do is we evaluate the actions based on where their preconditions first appear in the fact layer. So you see action number three, it's got three preconditions, fact four, five, and six, and all of them appear in fact layer one. Um, so we add the number of fact layers of all the preconditions, in this case 3 is the heuristic for action 3. Uh, whereas action 4 has got 4 preconditions, but 2 are in the uh, initial states uh, and 2 appear in fact layer 1. So the heuristic for this action is 2, so we go with this one. And we keep going and do the same thing for all their preconditions until we uh, figure out all the actions that achieve all the preconditions. Um, of all the actions that are part of the uh, relaxed planning graph. So this is the uh, relaxed plan. Action one, two, four will solve the relaxed version of the problem. So we return a three as the heuristic of the current states uh, to the uh, current goal state. It's not optimal though, because optimal would be to choose action three, because even though it's got three preconditions in fact layer one, there's actually a single action, action zero, that achieves all of them. So the optimal solution is action three and zero uh, take, takes us from the initial state to the, uh, to the goal state. Uh, furthermore, we also take into consideration the actions that appear in the first action layer, 
of the uh, solution and uh, mark them as helpful. Uh, and we tell the, the planning system to uh, prioritize these actions first before all the other actions, because we reason if it's a solution to your relax problem, it might also be a good idea to use these actions in the uh, um, uh, original problem. So above the heuristic, also to make sure that we prune the search space, because you might have the best heuristic in the world, but if your branching factor is like 20,000, which actually is only for Genus 2, um, you still are spending a lot of time uh, finding what the uh, solution is to your problem. So what we did is we removed the number of objects that we consider, because Evo Genus 2 got about 4,000 different uh, bits of furniture, and a lot of those are just purely cosmetic, like little plants and trees and bits to make your um, layer look very nice. But we don't care about that, so we can remove all of those. Uh, I can remove all a uh, bit of furniture and rooms that we actually never are going to use sure, purely because they don't add any value uh, to the uh, to the problem we're trying to solve. Secondly, we can prune actually can never be executed. So what we do here is we look at all the goals and we check all the actions that can achieve that goal and mark them as they might be helpful to achieve this uh, to solve this problem. And we mark their preconditions also as uh, sub goals and figure out which actions can achieve the sub goals and keep going backwards. And all the actions that do not appear in this graph are completely useless. We can guarantee they will never be, will never help achieving any of the goals or sub goals of the current problem. So we can easily ignore them. And this brought back the um, the deep branch effect for like twenty thousand to maybe ten or worst case maybe twenty or twenty five, which is a massive win actually allowed us to solve the problems that we uh, need to solve in Genus 2. So if eventually uh, we managed to uh, solve uh, and basically complete all the games in Zombie before, including all the DLC levels. Uh, same for Evil Genus 2, we managed to complete the entire game for, with all genuses with all the current uh, DLC available. And because we're so, so successful in this approach, we now are moving into doing multiplayer testing, doing stuff like achievement hunting, where I basically try to create a plan to uh, achieve all the achievements in the in the game to make sure that they can actually, um, they're not marked in any way. Uh, and also we now are providing the game uh, designers with additional data. So after a complete playthrough of Evil Genius 2, we say, uh, we create like a, um, um, a row in a spreadsheet where say after every objective we say what the current state of the layer is. So how much power are we using, how many minutes do we have, how many specialist minutes do we have. So this can then be used by the game designers to uh, look at potentially balancing uh, the game. So just to give an idea of how long it took to complete Evil Genius 2. So it took about 60 plus hours on average, depending which genius you are, you are using. Um, and normally what I would do, I basically uh, fire up the input sim Friday uh, Friday before I log off, I go back on Monday and see the game being completed, which is uh, pretty nifty, I would say. So the results, uh, so we found like 150 box, which uh, exclude the uh, crashes. There's mostly game design box where we got to a state where we couldn't progress because either like a bug in the uh, objective or a bug in the bit of furniture, we we're going to some kind of death spiral where all of a sudden the entire layer was unmanageable because no minions would do anything anymore. Uh, and because we had found like such weird box, it got very buying from production leads and, uh, and design. And all of them very, uh, very keen and very happy with all the um, um, advantages of this new input sim that we uh, could provide them. Um, so in terms of the planning, it took less than a second to solve most uh, most problems um, and less than 20 megabytes. The worst case where we uh, planned for like a massive problem that didn't have a solution, we took about 180 megabytes and it took about over a minute to uh, to figure out. We extended the number of uh, states we allowed to expand and just, just gave up. So lead design and design were very happy uh, with what we, uh, we've, we've, uh, we've established. So lastly, we go into uh, explainable planning, which is like a new bit of uh, tech that we've, uh, we, we are currently developing. So the idea here is that we um, that can actually can uh, look at the planning system and can actually ask uh, questions. So 
when you see an AI system uh, operate on any capacity, whether it be like a Roomba or a robot moving about, you also like we always like wonder like why you're not doing this thing as opposed to what I do now. So in this case, why did you not blow up the other door of C4? Um, and using explainable planning, the planning system might explain to you like either like, it's not possible or be really more time consuming or, co or consume like more uh, uh, more resources uh, to kind of explain to you like why it's making the decision it, uh, it does. So similarly here, it's like, why did he kill this zombie? Like, what's the purpose of, of doing so? And what we'll time, like, well, actually, he killed a zombie to get a key to open this particular, uh, particular door. And it's like a very active uh, branch of research. And it's also very important when you look at applications like uh, self drivable cars, where you figure like, well, if the user doesn't understand how these systems work and what decisions make, it makes on the roads, why would users trust these systems and explainable planning is one of the many ways you can go about exploring if the user maybe know more how the AI operates and how it makes its decisions it might be more um, more trustworthy and people might be more keen to to use their services because they understand what they're trying to to do so in our case we are looking explicitly into the problem why can't I find a solution to a problem um, so Normally what I do when we get the results in the morning is look at this particular table with the test results and see if there's any levels that could not be completed because the system is so robust that if you find a level not being completable by any uh, system, it might be a bug. So here we see two, so hell base and military uh, base woods don't seem to have found a, uh, a solution and run for entire level. So what we do is we look at the screenshots this hell base, we basically breeze through them and every three minutes we see, see like a snapshot. So here we see that a player might be stuck in the sewers exploring and it does like random walks here trying to potentially trigger uh, a volume trigger to uh, to get like something uh, something go. But it seems to be walking aimlessly and eventually gives up. So it seems to get stuck in the sewers for some reason. Uh, and normally I have to build up the level, get to the location, figure out what might be going on with a level designer. It's like a very uh, complex and time-consuming task. In this case, it appears that the uh, trigger volume was too small. The play could actually squeeze by and not trigger the next uh, combat in this, in this system. So military base, we do the same thing. We look at this seems to be progressing well. And seems to be moving forward, but eventually it runs out of time and it didn't finish the level course. It didn't get stuck somewhere, it just didn't have enough time to uh, kill the zombie in a foul siege, which is fine. So, so what we want to look into is like, well, what happens if we can't find a plan at all? So let's, in this case, remove the keys from the zombie's inventory and now, if we say to the planner, right, get me to the goal location, the planner goes, there's no plan. And the question is, why? because it doesn't help much if we load a level, we enable the input sim and nothing happens. I mean, it's not very informative and we don't quite know what's going on. We can see the goals, you can look at the initial state and try to like manually figure out what might be going on, uh, but it's very time consuming and unnecessary. So what we want to do is to find out uh, why there's no solution and have the planning system explain to us why it can't find a solution and suggest a potential uh, answer to this. So we assume that the domain model is correct, it might not be, but we assume for, uh, for our purpose that it is correct. And there's a fault in level setup, so some fact is missing in initial states uh, that makes the planning problem unsolvable. So the question is then, well, how do we find the missing facts uh, that we need to add to make this planning problem solvable again? And there's many different solutions people have proposed. So one is to look at landmarks, which in context of AI planning are facts uh, that must be achieved for every viable uh, solution to the planning problem you look at. So in our case, we must get the key to open the door to get to the goal location, for instance. Uh, other people look at abstractions, where you abstract the, uh, the model enough by deleting some constraints until you find a section where a, a problem can be found and use that with the um, um, constraints you remove to figure out what might be going on and what might be causing uh, the, planning, the, plan, uh, the planning problem not to be um, solvable. So we 
looked at a different uh, way of doing things by constructing like a partial order planning problem where we actually allow the planner to insert facts in the initial state at great cost. So let's have a look. So here we have start at the end. So start at the goal to have the, the, the player being at the goal location. And we say, right, we got a move action that moves the player from some location to the goal location. And they got their two preconditions, the player being at that location and that location being connected to the goal location. And we actually find a state initial state because the uh, door to front location is connected to the goal location. So we can then combine that variable and now we've got a, a single flaw in the plan because the player is not at the uh, door to front location, but is at the, at the player location. So we need to move the player from some other location to the location behind the door. These are preconditions. Uh, to get to that location, we need to move the player again from another location and we can actually bind this because we know that the player location where the player starts is connected to the location in front of the door. So we can uh, solve those, that flaw in the plan and now uh, we need to connect the locations uh, behind and in front of the door which we can do by opening the door. So we can say we must open some door with some item that make these two uh, uh, location connectors. So the preconditions that we know of such a door because door number two does exactly that. So we can now say right can open door number two with a key that will connect these two locations that allows the player to move through the door and get to the goal location. And the only thing we need to solve now is to make sure that the player's got the key by picking such a key up. And the key being a location is not true and cannot be true in the current uh, playing problem. But after searching different ways, eventually the playing system goes right. Uh, I get to the point where it's cheaper to just cheat and assume a fact is true than try to extend all the other playing problems or other, other partial order of our plans. Uh, and eventually it goes like, right, let's just assume the key is at the play location so then the player can pick it up where it is, open the door with it and then eventually move to get to the uh, goal location. So we can then explain that well, we can't achieve the player being at the goal location because we can't open the door because we can't get the player, the, can't get the player, the key into the player's inventory, and a suggestion might be to add a key to where the player starts. So we can write something, uh, translate that into human language, but say we can't reach objective mark with QID yada 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 at that location, which is the goal location, because the component reinforced door of a certain QID can't be opened. Uh, because item key can't be acquired. So it's just fixes, add a key at this location, or change the reinforced door so it can be opened without using uh, a key. So this is um, yeah, a bit of work we are doing at the uh, the moment. Uh, and it's already uh, operational and, uh, and working, which is uh, pretty cool. So a bit of future work. So I want to look into uh, adding temporal planning because currently we uh, try to minimize the number of actions, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, short or basically doesn't take enough time to execute. But basically by adding temporal planning, I actually say, well, minimize the time it takes if I to, uh, to execute the, uh, to, to, to solve the, the problem. Uh, another thing you look at is like goal recognition. So if we've got a um, adversarial AI that basically tries to play against the player, we want to figure out what's the player doing. It's basically moving into this direction, but what is over there that the player needs? And can we do something about it to stop the player acquiring it? Uh, and lastly, we are currently looking to reinforcement learning uh, because some data is embedded into flow graphs, which we can't uh, query uh, during runtime. So for example, if you've got like a dialog system, then it's not entirely clear what dialog options to pick to you know, get a certain reward or to trigger certain quests. Uh, I'm currently looking into like reinforcement learning approaches to, to solve this. So instead of using behavior trees, use like reinforcement learning uh, to execute uh, actions. So that's all we've got. So if you've got any further questions on Twitter, you can always email me. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and have a great conference. Thank you.